here is a chair growing arms. Marvelous, isn't it? How they can just naturally grow out of, the, of nowhere. This guy's done a pretty good job because he's picked up the volute from the ear and put it onto the arm. He's got his proportions right and so forth. But what he can't do is make the chair wider. And it was somebody who had a set of six side chairs and they wanted two armchairs and four side chairs. They'd inherited them. You know, that nasty, wicked sister got the armchairs in the splitting up of the family assets, you know. And so that was the way to do it. It's legitimate. It can happen. It's no big deal, except it completely devalues the set as an authentic antique. Very useful to have armchairs. Not necessarily more valuable because it has arms if they're not original. Another repairer's art, I started to say faker's art, that's not really fair, is the use of a cuff. Anytime you have a cuff on a leg, look very carefully at it because there are several characteristics that it should have. The wood should distinctly lay across here and really abruptly change the course of the wood coming down. And we have three pieces of wood to make this. And you can almost, you can see the shadow there because this has shrunk and moved a little bit with time. But we have the large piece of mahogany and two pieces of boxwood or holly strung across to make the break. What you want to do is check the wood here and make sure the grain pattern that is up here reemerges down below. Because the easiest way to fake up the height of something that has lost the bottom of its feet is to put a cuff to hide where you put the joint. So check out and make sure that the wood emerges from, from right through. Everybody understand that? Yeah. Are those, uh, are those uh, stuck on at a later date. Yes, those start about 1880. I've seen some with patent dates as early as 1880. But of course, 1780, no. They've been stuck on there by somebody to make it easier to slide it around. So here we see again a close-up. We can see the shrinkage. We can see how that was laid in. Look at another leg on the same sideboard. Good thing about it is you can really see here what I'm talking about, the grain continuing. So it's definitely one leg, but oopsie, oopsie, the leg is here too. We can see the grain pattern going straight down. The camera shot right through the stain that had been put here to make it look like it was inlaid. And in fact, it was a replaced leg on the piece. Very skillfully done, but not skillfully enough. He didn't bother to put a real piece of inlay in there, which is really incomprehensible given they did all the little line inlay, which was a heck of a lot harder to do. But anyway, uh, always be suspicious. Always be looking at every cuff you encounter to see what it might reveal. Chairs. Sometimes I'll walk into a room and somebody will say, look at my beautiful new 18th century chair. And I'm from here to there. And I'll say, oh, that's a really nice 19th century or 20th century copy of an 18th century chair. Because the wonderful stretcher system is centered in the legs rather than flush with the outer edge of the legs. Rarely, rarely, rarely are they ever anything but flush to the outer edge. And the reason is it's easier for the cabinet maker to make his marks, to know where to put the mortise and tenon to make the cuts if he measures from that back edge. But for the machine and the doweling to put it together, it's easier for the machine to center it and measure the leg dead in the middle. And you put a dowel in, and you put another dowel in, and it's done. So if you see 
box stretchers and H stretchers that are not flush with the outer edge of that leg, 98% of the time the piece is a copy of a later period. And the other thing you will generally find in antique chairs is that the back, the shoe as we call it, where the splat comes down and fits in, is made in two parts here. And again, it's ease of making. Rather than making this one piece of wood, they would make two pieces of wood. This is, you can see the, see the pegs? Big tenons going into their leg. Big tenon going into this leg. Two pegs. And then this piece glued on top and this mortised into that top of the shoe. Look at that one. It's one piece. And that chair is the mate to an armchair that I found in Chapel Hill. That chair is sitting on display in Williamsburg, and I'm happy to say the armchair is now as well. And when I encountered that armchair, all sorts of alarm bells went off in my head. I'm thinking, oh god, you know, look at, the, look at the back edge here. It's been silhouetted. Remind me to come back to that in just a second. That's, a, that's an indication of good cabinet making in the 18th century. It's pegged together. It showed lots of wear. It was beautiful wood. When I lifted out the seat, I could see hand-woven hand fabric and so forth that appeared to be the original underneath what was on it. Everything was right. And yet, this was an integral, an integral shoe, I-N-T-E-G-R-A-L, integral shoe, instead of a detached shoe. It was one piece, not two pieces. And I started going through my books. I asked them questions about their family history and all of that. And well, some of them were Charleston and some of them were Williamsburg, but they were all Southerners. So I started getting out my Southern furniture books. And I went through a few, and lo and behold, in Wallace Gussler's book on Virginia furniture, I found these side chairs. And they were the mate to the armchair that I was dealing with. And they were made in the Anthony Hay workshop, the same place as that first piece was made, about 1770, for the Waller family, which happened to be the family's name of the people I was doing the research for. And it said one of the strange, interesting, and eccentric characteristics of this workshop was the use of an integral shoe at a time when no other workshop did that. And so that alarm bell, that need to worry, in, ended up authenticating a piece and making it a $100,000 chair, and one of, at that time, one of the very few known period southern armchairs of that era. That's a long time ago now. But there's a close-up. And here is this other aspect. And let me go back and forth. It's called chamfering. And the whole point of chamfering, I guarantee you this ain't chamfered. <laughs> if you look through those holes, straight on, you can see my face very clearly. You can see the square silhouette of that very, but the second you begin to not be square dead on to it, the thickness of it begins to muddy the outline of it. And so it's not as crisp when you view it. Straight on, it's crisp. Slightly off, it's no longer crisp. Cabinet maker understood that. And what he did was take away, very carefully, cuts away some of the wood. He chamfers wood off the back edge so that when you view that chair, there's less bulk to obstruct the beauty of looking through it. Because the lost space is as important as the carved space. Machines don't chamfer. Fakers know to chamfer, but machines don't. All antiques have wear. For heaven's sakes, 
It's been used. It was made to be used. Look for wear. Wear is a sign of authenticity. This chair leg used to come down about like that. And with time, it wore off. And it wore off slightly unevenly, depending on the floor it was dragging across and so forth. Everywhere you look on an antique, you should find signs of wear. The drawers should have had their runners rebuilt. All sorts of honest, legitimate housekeeping repairs to augment wear or just left alone wear. But no wear, no antique. Stretchers. Look at the wear on a stretcher. Can you see how that nice little turning there has been rubbed away by people's feet? You know, we all do that. You know, this is a big ladder back chair, big bulky chair. You know, you'd sit down in it. Oh, you know, you're having a nice conversation, a drink, and you just sort of put your feet there. Well, when you have a chair with stretchers, Sit down in it and put your feet where the wear is. And if you look like this, that is sandpaper rather than feet that caused the wear. Because fakers love to put wear on things, but they get carried away and they put it so often in the wrong place. I had a guy send me big stretcher base table, pictures. He said, David, do you think this is a 17th century uh, refectory table? You know, look at all the wear on the stretcher. I called him because in those days there was no other way to communicate. <laughs> and I said, you idiot. Look where the wear is. It's all underneath the stretchers. Did they sit there and rub their, scratch their toes for the last 300 years? and left the tops totally untouched. It's a fake. You know, I mean, but that's what I was talking about early on. It's logic. Let your mind be logical. Think about it. Think what would be normal. Think what you as a person would do to use something. All antiques, if they have not been refinished, have a beautiful aspect which dealers love to call patina. Patina is dirt, grease, and grime. And it builds up in the recesses. And with time, a piece becomes more beautiful than it was the day it was made. It always makes me cringe when I hear somebody says, oh yeah, I restore antiques. It'll look just like the day it was made when I finish. And I think, in other words, it won't be anywhere near as beautiful as it is now. You want, when you are working with an original finish that has a beautiful patina, to enhance that by gentle, delicate cleaning, not just savage it and take it all away and make it look like what it looked like the day it was made. Because believe me, it just wasn't as pretty when it was made. All you have to do is go back and forth and look at a new reproduction today and a 200-year-old piece and you can see that clear difference. There's nothing wrong with it. 200 years from now, that piece made today will have patina also. The other thing that happens is things get oxidation. Wood oxidizes. It literally changes color. And this generally, we're talking about the unfinished part of the piece. So the back, the bottom, the interior of the drawers. It's all darkening, gently year after year after year exposed.